We're going to look now at our sermon this morning, and our sermon, of course, is the final one of our series, Faith of Our Fathers. This is the closing moment, and as we do, I kind of feel a lot like the author of Hebrews felt when he wrote in chapter 11 that there's just not enough time, that time would not suffice. Indeed, the individuals that we've looked at and that we've studied and surely have much more they can teach us. But this is one of the joys of the Christian faith and the Christian life. We're not living by some old dusty book filled with stories that have already been fully fleshed out, but we're living as followers of a living word, a word that doesn't change its teaching or its interpretation, but a word that breaks, exposes, challenges, and changes our heart. As it says in Hebrews 4.12, For the word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and of spirit, of joints and of marrow, and discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. And I found this to be very true in our current series. I've seen it pierce the heart of y'all when you're here on Sunday mornings. I've felt the piercing of the heart myself when I'm studying through the text and then when I'm preaching it again on Sunday. And though the experience of having your heart pierced isn't always fun and it doesn't fill you with warm fuzzies, the result is a life molded to be more and more like Christ. As children of God, that's what we should desire. We should desire to grow to be more like Him. For it only serves to drive us closer to Him. We began this series with a sermon titled, Faith's Great Reward. And now today we conclude the series with a sermon title of, Faith's Great Challenge. Our text this morning, real short, one verse, Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1. And so if you're at home, I invite you to stand as we read it, and we do this out of respect for the Word of God. It's not just a tradition, but it's showing a sign of respect back to when the elders of Israel stood and had all the people stand when the Word was read. But as you're turning there, I remind you, as we do each and every week, that here at Columbia Presbyterian Church, we do believe that this is only one place in this entire universe we can go to find absolute truth. It is the Bible. Every single word of it is inspired by him. It is inerrant, which means it has no errors. So what it says is true is true. And it's infallible, meaning it will never fail. So we can trust it completely. And I know this morning, as we look at this verse, we can trust and believe that we will find what faith's great challenge is and just how we can meet it. So hear now the word of the Lord from Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1. Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us also lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. The grass withers, and the flower fades, but the word of our Lord endures forever. This is the word of the Lord. And the people said, let's pray. Holy Spirit, would you open up our hearts? Would you break the stony ground? Would you prepare us now for your word that it would plant deeply within us and change us greatly for you? We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. And if you're standing at home, you may be seated. Well, there's, in this one verse, as I said, just one simple verse, there are three directives, three challenges, if you will. Challenges that when taken to heart and faithfully pursued will result in living a life of faith. And these three challenges are this, lay aside every weight, lay aside the close sin, and endure the race. But before we begin I need to briefly address this cloud of witnesses. What is this cloud? Well, a cloud is simply a metaphor for the many who have come before us in the Christian walk. 
Chapter 11 highlights specific individuals, and then at the end, it just summarizes the whole mass of those who have followed. And so therefore, this cloud is used for the imagery due to its large, encompassing nature. In other words, what it's saying is everywhere that you turn in Scripture, in history, and in your life, you will find some witnesses, some testimony to a living faith. There were men of science such as Newton and Kepler who because of their faith made the great scientific discoveries of their day. There were men like Martin Luther and John Calvin who stood in faith against the corrupt church saying we must return to scripture alone and faith alone. People like John Newton whose eyes were open to the wickedness of slavery and then spends his life thereafter fighting to abolish it, and writing one of the most well-known songs in the world, Amazing Grace. But this cloud doesn't only contain famous people. My mother raised me to learn and know that the Bible is true because of her faith in Jesus. My first pastor that I really knew led a church in Neptune Beach, Florida, a little small town in Florida, And he stopped me perhaps during one of my maybe fourth or fifth baptisms. And he stops me and says to me, there's only one baptism. And he encouraged me that by faith I have been washed clean from my sins. You see, on and on the list goes, and I'm sure every one of you can think of your own list and your own individuals. And so you see, the idea of this cloud is not that it's literally people sitting around watching us as if they had nothing else to do when they're there in the presence of the Lord God of heaven and earth. Instead, this cloud is one of experience, of memory, of history. Everywhere we turn, there's another example of faith. And should you think there are no such examples in your life, there are no such examples in your circle, why well, I have good news for you. You have the Bible. And the Bible is filled with witnesses and testimonies of faith. So none of us are left without witness. None are left without testimony. So it's under that awareness that we then come to take up our three challenges of our text. So we look at this first challenge, which is lay aside every weight. Now the Summer Olympics have been postponed this year. But for those of you who've watched them before or watched any other competition, you know that every athlete is trying to find the edge, trying to find the way to minimize even the minutest little detail. You know, the gold and silver medals can oftentimes be separated by one one hundredth of a second. And so in order to gain these advantages, they will wear lighter clothes. They'll find ways to be wind resistant, uh, better traction in their shoes, a lighter material, shaving the hair all off their body, whatever it might be, they do what they can to reduce the weight so they can move and proceed even faster and more successful. And that kind of devotion and determination to compete is what Hebrews 12 is telling us that we should have in faith. If something hinders you from growing to be more like Christ, you ought to throw it aside. You ought to get rid of it immediately. You should toss it from your life. And if you're asking, well, how often should I do that? Or how much do I need to drop? What does the text say? It says every weight. Not just the big ones. Not just a few. But every weight. But here's the thing. Like any challenge, it's always easier said than done. It's most Christians will be hard-pressed to say they don't believe the Bible. And they won't deny, for the most part, the Bible calls to die to yourself. Yet, many will also say that that call is just simply an ideal, the kind of out-there goal that none of us really can or should strive for. It's just too difficult. But see, the sad reality is it's not that the requirement is too hard, it's that their hearts are too hard. They've grown to like their particular baggage 
more than they've grown to love the Lord. When they look at others, they feel they're further along than they are, so why should they have to change? You see, they're like a rich young ruler who came to Jesus asking, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus said, sell all that you have and give it to the poor. And yet, that was too much. Because that command exposed the man's heart and his love of money. So he departed sad, still encumbered by those weights. So this morning, ask the Holy Spirit. Ask him to show you what weight you're carrying, what should be laid aside. Perhaps for you, your weight is like the rich young ruler. Perhaps for you, you focus on money. How do you get more of it? How do you keep what you have? How do you hide what you have? Whatever it might be, but your focus is on money. That reveals the heart. It reveals a heart burdened with a sinful weight. And yes, in case you're wondering, it is still sinful even if you're doing it for a church or a ministry. When that gets in the way or hinders you or others' service for the kingdom, then it's a weight that must be dropped. Now perhaps for you, your weight isn't finances, but maybe it's public opinion. You're concerned with how people see you, what they think of you. You don't want anyone to ever be upset with you. You don't want anyone to ever talk bad about you or whatever it might be. So you go out of your way to please them, keep them happy. But see, even in that very description, going out of your way shows the weight that bears you down because it's turning you from the way and the path of faith and following Christ. Now we can list weight after weight after weight, but let's simply return to and hold the declaration of Scripture, which is this, lay aside every weight that hinders you. There's something in your life or heart that distracts you from living an obedient life of faith, then lay it aside. Give it away and return to the course that is set before all of us. Now, Hebrews doesn't stop there. It says, in addition to these weights that you're to cast off, you also must lay aside another item. You must lay aside close sin. Lay aside close sin. You see, while the weights we are to lay aside can be sinful, they're not always. You might be burdened for the lost and see all the people suffering without Christ and you feel a weight and a burden for them. And that is good until or unless that weight drives you to despair or drives you to say the task is too great and then you don't do anything. Then it becomes a sinful weight. But all these weights being aside, we now look at the sin and Here's the thing to remember. All of us are prone to sin. All of us are prone to rebellion to God. And there are certain sins, though, that each one of us finds we have to battle extra hard. We have to be extra on the defense against. And this is that sin which is close, or in some translations, a besetting sin. Identifying weights, trimming them down, can, in some cases, be done with self-reflection, a little discipline, changing your schedule around, whatever it might be. Laying aside the close sin requires a painful, deep heart analysis. Because, see, as humans, we are really gifted at and almost enjoy finding fault in others. We can point out how this one lives a certain way or does a certain thing, and commend ourselves for being less wicked because we don't do that particular sin. Yet when we do this, we're making a simple, logical failure. See, we're judging to shame, to condemn, or to silence somebody. So we're judging wrongly. To judge properly, we have to do as the Bible commands us. We call each other to repentance when we see someone in sin. That's what we're called to do, but we're to do it out of love for each other. You do it because you don't want to see a fellow brother or sister in the Lord living in this sin. We're to encourage each other this way. 
and we should take it serious because Jesus said very clearly that on the last day there will be many professing Christians who he will cast away saying I never knew you because they lived a life of unrepentant sin. Therefore, true love will drive true biblical judging. But see, a prideful heart drives condemning, mocking, angry judgment. And that's why this challenge is one of deep heart analysis. For often we're not really aware of our own besetting sin, our close sin. We don't oftentimes realize just how close we've come to that sin. And so like those commercials for the Febreze odor in control, it says you become nose blind to the smell or your heart has gone sin blind to that close sin. This is why we need each other. This is why we must worship together. This is why we must hear the proclamation of the word together. From the preaching of the word, we find the Holy Spirit convicts our hearts. We find our own pet sins called out as sin and exposed. And then we must respond with humility, brokenness, repentance. When I was in seminary at RTS in Orlando, one of our classes did a study on the seven deadly sins. Now, I went into this study very confident, here's the irony, and proud because I knew my sin was pride. However, the humbling experience was as we studied each one in depth to find out how much deeper each one goes, I also had this one and that one. By the end of the study, I was declaring to people, well, I have all seven. To which, again, ironically, I became proud. And see, there I was, back in the old reliable of pride. And I know that that's the setting close sin for me, that I have to battle at all times. Now, by the sheer love, mercy, and grace of God, through extreme loss, through pain, through difficulties, through ripping open my heart, God has been kind beyond measure to break pride. And yes, I'm still a work in progress. I still have ways to go. But by His grace, pride rises less and less in my life. So how do you identify what this close sin is for you? Or ask yourself a couple of questions. First, when something you do or hold on to is called out as sin, do you get angry? Do you get offended? Do you lash out when your thing is called out as sin? When you hear that if you're able, you should give more to your local church for the advancement of the kingdom of God, do you then get angry and start listing off everyone you know who you don't think gives enough or gives? When you're told that you have to repent and confess your guilt, do you reply, I'll only do that if they repent first? Do you leave church angry with your pastor instead of broken before God that sin rests in your heart? And you might be saying, well, I know my heart. I know what's in here. I'm only angry because they keep annoying me. Or I know my heart better than them anyway, and my heart is fine. I don't have any issues. Or remember, you have to be on guard against your heart. As Jeremiah 17, 9 says, The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately sick. Who can understand it? And that who entails me, it entails you, it entails everyone. Who can understand it? So what is your close sin? For some, it could be rooted in prejudices or in racism even. It could be a thinking that those who are different than you should be treated differently than you or should be kept in different places than you. For some, it's pride. For some, it's greed. For some, it's laziness. You just want others to do the work for you. Others have condemnation and judgmentalism. Yet others just love the constant game of 
sin unto. So no matter what it is, you must fight it and seek to leave it behind. And see, there's good news. If you truly seek the Holy Spirit's guidance, He will expose it to you. He will show you that sin. But you need to be prepared for some humbling, for some repentance, and yes, some pain. A lot like the same. No pain, no gain. So lay aside the weights. Lay aside the close sin. Those two challenges together then prepare us for this third and final challenge. Endure the race. Endure the race. I've said many times before, but I'll remind you again this morning, the Christian life, the Christian walk is not easy. It is not a simple little path. And there have been really silly attempts at rebuffing Christianity by claiming it's a religion, it's a crutch for the weak, for the weak-minded. And you know, that claim is not new. The Romans, back in the very beginning of the church, said Christianity was a religion for women and orphans. Now why? Why would people say that? Because on the outside looking in, it seems simple, it seems easy. Just say you've done bad, say you won't love money, and you're okay. However, the real Christian faith is far more than that. In fact, it takes character and resolve of great strength to walk the Christian walk. So the Christian walk as in our passage described as a race, a race that must be endured. Now, I don't know about you, but I've never had to be encouraged to endure something that was easy or enjoyable. You take me to CC's Pizza, you will not have to tell me to endure the unlimited pizza buffet. I will enjoy that easily. But the Christian life is one of a constant heart examination. It's a life of constant repentance. It's a life with one eye on the Word of God and the other eye at your own heart. And add to this that we're called to not just endure, but to endure with patience. Patience is the character trait of waiting with confidence in the result. As it applies to the Christian race, this patience is waiting in confidence for the day that we stand before God and see Him face to face, presented as perfect and holy before the Lamb. The day when there's no longer sin, no longer illness, no longer death. You see, enduring with patience is not just waiting and doing nothing. It's running. It's enduring. It's repenting. It's growing. It's patiently knowing that one day the race will be finished. Now here in our church, we're going through revitalization. And I'll tell you, I'm personally convinced that revitalization is one of the greatest tests and exposures of the patients in a church. It doesn't happen fast. And those who are weak in patience and endurance can often give up or grow anxious or lose hope. Yet it takes great patience because revitalization doesn't and can't come through programs or actions. It only comes just as promised in Scripture, through the change of hearts. And this heart change requires true repentance. It requires humility. It requires changing your perspective. And patient endurance requires giving up your interests for the interests of others. But notice it's not a passive command. You're not called to sit and be patient. Sit and be patient and wait. No, we're to be patient and have patience as we run, as we endure. Abraham spent years patiently enduring the race set before him. Moses spent years. Joshua spent years. King David was told over and over, wait, wait. But as we saw in each one of their lives, while waiting, they ran. Abraham moved to the land showed them. Moses 
led and taught the Jewish people the laws of God for 40 years in the wilderness. Joshua fought in battle after battle after battle. King David pursued God in repentance and worship, looking to that one great day where he stood in the temple of God. Likewise, you and I are called to run with patient endurance, not growing weary in well-doing, spurring each other on to good works, finding ways for every one of us to work in his kingdom for his purposes, but working patiently, not growing weary amid the race. The promise that he will complete the good work he began in us ought to give us the strength to endure. Looking at the lives of everyone we found in this chapter ought to drive us off the bench and into the game. Drawing on the principles of faith demonstrated in chapter 11 and in this great cloud of witnesses ought to motivate you and I toward lives of patient endurance. Faith's great challenge is to take the truths of the gospel and drive them deep into your heart. Faith's great challenge is to humble yourself before the Lord, confessing your needs, seeking his strength to run. Faith's great challenge is only possible because of the author of our faith, Jesus, our Messiah. So as I'm closing, I want to speak to you about the importance of having a starting line in the first place for the race. Because you see, if you've still not come to that point where Jesus is your Redeemer, where you have come to repentance and faith, relying on Him alone, crying out to Him for mercy, then you're not only outside of the race, you're not even in the stadium. See, the race begins by looking at your heart, looking at your life and comparing it with the Word of God. There are 613 commands found in the law of God. And to be perfect, to be free from judgment on that day, you must keep every one of them at every single moment. A feat that grows exponentially difficult when you take into account the words of James 2, verse 10. Whoever keeps the whole law but fails in one point has become guilty of all of it. So when you see that you truly are guilty, then you must profess that guilt and cry to him for mercy. You can see the power and message of the gospel is this. Every one of us has sinned. Every one of us is guilty before God on our own. But Jesus took on human flesh. He lived a life of perfect obedience so that his perfect record would be given to you while he takes away your record of guilt. Washing it away forever. But then Jesus did something else. As we saw last week, he willingly and joyfully went to the cross to die, to pay a penalty and a debt that you owe for your sin. He paid it in full. He was buried. And three days later, he rose again, demonstrating his victory over sin and death, demonstrating and showing to us the power of the promise that he has for each one who comes to him. All you have to do is acknowledge that truth and take hold of it. It's like a man who's inherited a million dollars in a massive home. All he has to do is go to the attorney, prove his identity, and then take hold of what is promised for him. So come to him today. Prove your identity through confession, profession of your sins. You are a sinner justly deserving God's wrath. And then take what is offered, which is the mercy, forgiveness, and redemption of God. At that point, you can join every believer, past, present, and future, in the great race of faith, laying aside the weights, laying aside the close sin, and enduring with patience till you cross the finish line. Let us all be found so doing when our master returns. Here's your takeaway for you. For those outside of Christ, 
join the race. Don't let this day pass without enduring the race. Make today the first day of the rest of your journey of faith. And for those in Christ, lay it all aside for him. Stealing from JFK and modifying it a little bit. Don't ask what the church and the Lord will do for you, but ask what you can do for the Lord and for his church. Do you need to stop worrying over church stats? Well, do it. Do it now and do it today. Do you need to just simply get up and get back in the race? Then do it now. Do it today. If you let concerns and worries of everyday life weigh you down, turn your eyes from Jesus. Well, stop, pray, and return to him today. Run this race of faith with patient endurance and by the power of the Holy Spirit meet and grow in this faith's great challenge. Let's pray. Holy Spirit, we thank you that your word is living, that your word is true. It's also powerful. It's challenging. It can shake us completely. But the Holy Spirit, we know that the intent of your word is to draw us close to you, to make us more like Christ. So we ask that you would expose that sin that so easily besets us, that lays so close. Would you expose the weights in our lives that we need to drop and get rid of? Would you restore us and strengthen us, set our eyes back on the course before us, return us to the right path, that we may run the race well and hear from you, well done, good and faithful servant. Father, we ask that this will be done in our lives, even now, in Jesus' name, amen.